Good evening, and welcome to tonight's TI Technology webinar hosted by Texas Instruments. For tonight, we're going to take a look at some life-saving STEM projects. My name is Mike Houston, and I'm the moderator for this event. I teach algebra and calculus near Pittsburgh, where I use TI Technology to make tough to teach, tough to learn concepts accessible to all my students. I'm really excited to introduce our two panelists for tonight, Eric Archer and Jeff Lukens. Eric is the market strategy manager for the worldwide science and STEM education markets at Texas Instruments. He continues to lead the efforts for the development of content-based STEM programs such as STEM Behind Hollywood and STEM Behind Health. Eric, thanks so much for being with us tonight. Thanks, Mike. And when he retired from teaching in 2014, Jeff had taught high school science for 34 years. He now delivers professional development across North America for T-Cubed as a full-time science instructor. He continues to author activities for all levels of science teachers and learners. Jeff, thanks so much for being with us tonight. You bet, Mike. Good to be here with everybody. We're expecting a large crowd, so your audio is muted. Feel free at any time to send questions to either Eric or Jeff using the Q&A window on the right side of your screen. As a reminder, this session is being recorded, and we'll provide a link to the event certificate of attendance at the conclusion of the webinar. We hope you don't have any audio issues tonight, but in the event that you do, you can find your name in the participant window, and in that same window near the bottom of that uh, participant window is an icon that looks like a phone. By clicking on that phone icon, you'll get call in information. So if you're having audio issues, uh, try and find that phone icon and call in using a phone, and that should uh, resolve any potential audio issues that you have. At this point, Jeff is going to discuss our agenda. All right, thanks, Mike. And uh, again, welcome, everybody. It's good to have all you guys um, curious about these life-saving STEM projects that we're going to be working on and showing you tonight. They're, they're pretty much brand new projects that uh, some good folks at Texas Instruments and some teachers around the country and around the world actually have helped uh, develop for TI. Uh, the first of those is, actually this is the second one we're going to do, is, is something called the Smart Irrigation System. And there's a really pretty cool human interest backstory about uh, a, a region of Zimbabwe in Africa uh, that sort of inspired this, uh, this project to be developed. So we'll do that one actually second in our agenda tonight. The first thing we're going to take a look at is something called a smart car design, and maybe not the kind of smart car you guys are envisioning, but a smart car with control mechanisms that are able to sense when environmental conditions inside the car get a little rough for living things, like I'll just kind of leave that hanging there for a little bit so you guys can use your imagination. But um, some of the, the cool stuff that TI has now with coding and with sensors and with uh, this thing called the TI Innovator, uh, those are actually used in, in both of these projects. Uh, toward the end of our time tonight, Mike will rejoin us. Uh, we'll hear his voice again. He'll talk about some online resources that are available, not just for these life-saving STEM projects, but also he'll take a look at our TI website and, and show you some of the really amazing resources that are there for free. And then finally, we got the uh, T-Cube International Conference in 2018, early March in San Antonio, Texas, and somebody tonight is going to win a registration for two people to that great conference, which uh, again is, is like a big TI love fest in, in San Antonio, Texas in early March. Thanks, Jeff. And uh, if Jeff, if you wouldn't mind also discussing the expected outcomes? Absolutely, Mike. Uh, here's kind of what we're going to be looking at today. We're going to be uh, taking a look at, like I said, the smart watering system and uh, how we can use a very, very small technology setup to model a large-scale uh, operation to irrigate a garden using water from that's collected in a cistern. A cistern is just a big 
a pit or a big hole in the ground or somewhere that's co that collects water and then we can water from it, sort of like a gigantic rain barrel essentially. Uh, then we're going to take a look at uh, designing and building a pet smart, there you go, there's, your, there's a hint, a pet smart car alarm system uh, that prevents pets from overheating in a, in a vehicle. And you can probably all come up with uh, maybe some, some horror stories that you've heard in the past of this happening in the summertime, especially in areas of the country where it's uh, a little bit hotter uh, in the summertime. And then we'll take a look at how all of this stuff brings together the, the four aspects of the acronym STEM, which is science, mathematics, engineering, and technology. And I know those aren't listed there specifically, and I didn't name them in the right order, but I think everyone's pretty familiar at this point with what the meaning of STEM is all about. So that's what we're hoping to get done tonight in the next uh, 50 minutes or so. Thanks so much, Jeff. Eric, uh, you have control. Feel free to share your screen. It's all yours. All right, thanks a lot, guys. Let's see my screen. Uh, annotate the shared content. All right, I don't know what that means, but uh, I'm going to go ahead and prove. Hopefully, everybody can see my screen. Um, Jeff, thanks for the introduction. And uh, uh, over the next 50 minutes or so, Jeff and I are going to spend um, time talking to you about. Uh, these projects, and these were, I don't know what that's doing. Oops, sorry. All right, I'm in an annotation mode, and I don't know why. <laughs> All right, there we go. Okay, so um, th these projects started when um, the TI Innovator was launched. Uh, it was uh, launched uh, almost, well, I guess about a year and a half ago. and. Um, the whole point behind the TI Innovator for those, you know, who are new to this is that uh, TI is a corporation. We are a STEM corporation. We have lots and lots of engineers, computer programmers, quality assurance type folks. We have a ton of STEM jobs and STEM openings uh, that we need to um, fill with, with qualified uh, individuals. And so uh, the CEO of TI, uh, Rich Templeton, and, and others in the leadership at TI, um, challenged the education technology division, those of us that are in the, the calculator and math and science software division, to, um, uh, to, to find a way to get more students into coding as well as um, STEM in general. And so we took um, one of the, the TI products called an MSP430, uh, 432 actually. It's a microcontroller. It's a way for engineers and Motorola and Apple and all these other big companies to evaluate um, uh, chips, uh, microprocessors to see if they'll work in their, their phones and tablets and automobiles and, and any other system that uses um, a chip, uh, chances are there's a TI product in it. But uh, we wanted to make that available to students, and so that's where the TI Innovator Hub came from. It's basically a, uh, a TI microcontroller that we put some plastic around and, and we built it up to protect it from <laughs> middle school and high school um, student use. Uh, so it's very robust, um, very reliable. And uh, so when we got that off the ground, the next step was to come up with really interesting projects that we thought uh, teachers and students would, would be into. Um, one of the first things I did in learning this, and by the way, I'm a biology person, so coding was not my thing. I never coded before with the exception of maybe the VCR back in the day. Um, and, and so uh, for me, this was all new. And so I jumped on, uh, at that time, a new resource called 10 Minutes of Code and learned how to do some very basic level coding on uh, TI Basic, which, by the way, all of the TI graphing calculators use TI Basic. It's a language that's been around for a long time. It's very easy to learn, and uh, especially with 10 Minutes of Code. Um, so my son at the time, my younger son, was in middle school, and he had to do a science fair project, and I you know, sort of uh, uh, harassed him enough to uh, uh, consider doing it with the TI Innovator Hub. Well, uh, it, 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 it was a great experience uh, now that it's over, but uh, during it, it was, it was frustrating because uh, he wanted to do it one way and I, I thought he should do it another way, uh, <laughs> you know, being the overbearing father. Uh, and, and so what we ended up coming, coming up with was a, uh, a smart car 
um, that uses several uh, very inexpensive sensors uh, to monitor the heat inside of a car, the temperature rather, uh, as well as detecting the presence of, of in, in the case of my son's science for project, we were trying to detect the, the uh, presence of a human being because of all of the um, unfortunate uh, uh, heat strokes that are caused by leaving, you know, kids in cars and hot parking lots. And it's, it's crazy that it still happens, but it does. And so, um, you know, for science fair, it's one of those things where you got to solve a real world problem. Uh, the original project used a sensor called a PIR, which is basically a proximity infrared sensor, um, and it picks up small uh, bits of motion. And so uh, we use that to detect the presence of a, a person. Uh, and then the next step was to detect the temperature in the car. And if both of those conditions were met, then the car would roll down its windows, it would honk its horn, flash its lights to say, hey, I need help. There's somebody in the car. We need to help them. Uh, uh, the project was very well received by the, uh, the school science fair folks, uh, but unfortunately, uh, my son, whom I love very much, uh, left his logbook at home and he was disqualified <laughs> from science fair. So, uh, uh, and then, and then um, my coworker shared an article with me last week showing that a, another student did a similar project not too long ago, and they won science fair. So, <laughs> you know. So anyway, I just make, if you have kids doing science fair, make sure they bring their log uh, But anyway, my son had to learn how to code as well because neither of us were uh, programmers. So we got on TI uh, codes. Um, we did the 10 minutes of code uh, a little bit every night. And, um, you know, lo and behold, we, we learned how to code. It was pretty cool. Um, from there, we learned how to use the innovator. And the innovator has uh, three input ports and three output ports on it. Uh, of course, more advanced projects, you could use uh, the breadboard port, which is on this side of it. Uh, hopefully, you can see my screen. Um, and the, the sensors we use, uh, we used a couple of temperature sensors. One of those temperature sensors was for monitoring the outside temperature, and one was for monitoring the inside temperature. Now, what was really cool about that is if you're teaching physical science, um, you could do a really cool greenhouse effect experiment by measuring the temperature outside and inside for 10 minutes. Um, I had a little heat lamp set up so it would heat up the outside and inside um, of the, you know, inside of the car. And you do see a pretty significant difference in temperature. And we just used saran wrap when we wrapped the outside of the car up. Uh, just a little toy car that we got from Walmart. I think it was like four or five bucks. And so very affordable. Uh, so, so let me let me show you um, some of the images so you actually know what I'm talking about. So here's the car. Um, we've we've heavily modified this car, uh, but what you're looking at here is um, there's a temperature sensor on the dashboard. Uh, we put a couple of LED lights, uh, just little light emitting diode lights. And these lights, I think they're like a couple of bucks a piece. Online, you can get these things online through Amazon or through other electronics suppliers. Um, but uh, these these are these will flash when when you tell them to flash. We also mounted a servo motor, um, which is just a weird name for a motor. I don't know why it's called a servo. I'm not a like I said, I'm a biology guy. Uh, but we cut a little piece of plastic to sort of represent rolling down the windows, and then hopefully. Uh, hopefully, I've got some other images pulled up here for you to see. Um, uh, let's see here. Yeah, here they are. Uh, and then on the back side of the car, um, <laughs> so what you have here is, if you don't pay attention to the floating dog, um, I'll tell you about that in a second. But there is a sensor on the bottom here called a Hall sensor, and it's basically measuring the Hall effect. So if there are any physical science or physics people, you guys know what that means better than I do. But essentially, my understanding of it is it'll, it'll pick up changes in magnetic, man, magnetic fields. And so what we did is to represent um, a living creature being inside the car, we we got some little plastic doggies. I think this is a beagle, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and we we put some magnets on the beagle. Now, in real life, you know, I highly recommend not gluing, hot gluing magnets to the feet of your dog or cat or uh, human. But uh, we did that here just um, just to show a model, uh, and these magnets were a little bit too big to put on the collar of the dog, so we just hot glued them to its feet. Uh, 
So when the dog is in the presence of this hall sensor, it'll detect the dog. It'll know that the dog's in the car. So that was condition one. Um, and then condition two, like I mentioned before, is that the car knows that the, uh, the dog is, is present. So uh, that was the point there. Um, here's another image just to show this little red light on the hall sensor lights up when, when the magnet is um, nearby. And so it knows that there's, hey, there's a magnetic field here, um, you know, and it will respond. Uh, so, that, so that's how that works. Now, uh, before I show you the video, because I was going to try to do this live on a webcam, and I, I know better than that because, you know, WebExes can be a little weird sometimes. Uh, so I, I pre-recorded a video, and I'm going to show that to you in a second. But uh, I want to talk a little bit more about when you would do these projects, because these projects are not trivial. Um, they require some time. And uh, the way we did it, and Jeff will talk more about this on the Smart Water Project, too, um, but the way we did it is we found some schools in the Dallas Metroplex that were willing to do a before-school STEM camp. And this was a middle school project, this car alarm project, the, uh, the Smart irrigation system Jeff will show you is more of a high school project. Of course, you can do either of these in middle school or high school. It doesn't really matter. Um, but what we did is we found this middle school, and we found a teacher that was willing to, to learn this stuff uh, and host a once-a-week 45-minute camp before school. Um, and we had these kids design their own cars uh, and, and um, learn how to do some of the coding, and then we had them we gave them all of the components, but the kids themselves actually designed the code and they designed how their car was gonna work. Um, now we did some hand holding the first half of the uh, STEM camp and this was a 10 session camp. So we had 10 45 minute sessions once a week. So it was two and a half months long and the kids could not get enough of it. It, it, was, it was a lot of fun and it was really, really cool. Um, so uh, so let, me, let me show you real quick. Um, by the way, you can download all of these materials. Right now, uh, we're hosting them on the P-Cube European site because we have pilot sites over there currently doing these projects. Um, we will have these projects in a much cleaner format, uh, uh, probably early spring, we're hoping. Um, but you, you can see the image here, uh, kids working on, on the project. There's a Word document, a PDF, this sample code here is uh, for TI Inspire CX. Of course, we have a TI 84 plus CE version of both of these projects. So whatever platform you're using, um, we have all the materials. Like I said, they're just kind of uh, they're just kind of rough. Um, you know, we're not, they're not polished or cleaned up, but they're you know, I mean, they work pretty well. And so all of that stuff's free. And I think Mike's going to share this um, share this uh, link with you in a little while. But uh, like I said, all of this is free and uh, it's online. So here's some images. They're probably small on your computer. I don't, I don't think I can blow them up anymore. But uh, just these kids working on, on this project, they just, they just had a lot of fun with it. It was pretty cool. And it was more meaningful too, because we're talking about, you know, saving lives here, uh, just like the webinar um, told you we would talk about. So it's pretty cool. Now, uh, real quick, I wanna jump over to a TI Inspire CX document. Uh, this is uh, this can be downloaded from that link I showed you a minute ago. Uh, this is a very rough document. It's not been polished. It's not like a stem behind Hollywood or stem behind health document. These are all just you know kind of rough files, but available to you. Um, and and so the the second page I'm showing you here talks about where to plug in the sensors on the TI Innovator Hub. Um, so like I said, there are three input sensors. There's two temperatures and a hall sensor. And then the output, uh, we've got an, two LEDs for the headlamps of the car and a servo, um, which is, controls the power window. Now, in addition, uh, if you didn't know, the TI Innovator Hub also has some built-in functionality. So it has a built-in uh, RGB LED, so a red, green, blue LED, and then you can mix those colors to make pretty much whatever color you want. It has a speaker on it as well, and so for this project, we're using that speaker uh, to represent the horn of the, of the automobile. So you have three inputs, but really you have multiple outputs, more than three. So you have the two LEDs for the headlamps, you've got the servo, 
And then there's the horn, which is uh, controlled by the speaker. And I, hopefully this doesn't scare you away because I want to go through the code itself just a bit. Um, this was all new to me. It was a little intimidating at first, uh, especially for a biology guy that, that has never coded. Um, but as, as I learned it, it made a lot of sense. It started making a lot of sense to me. So what we're looking at um, here is the send. You'll see all these send commands. And what that means is it's uh, that your calculator is sending this command, connect temperature one, to the input port, which is we label N1. Uh, and then the other stuff here is just related to the actual temperature sensor itself. But the send is you're sending this command to the TI Innovator Hub. And then it, from there, it will, uh, it will control um, these sensors or read these sensors or, or uh, whatever you're telling it to do. Now, uh, not all of our sensors or all of our motors or LEDs have a name um, in, the TI, uh, in the TI basic menu. And so, for example, if I go to this, this uh, menu here and I go down to Hub, you'll see all of these commands um, here. And so you can say, okay, well, these are all of the things I want to I wanna, I have access to. But what you're going to see is you notice we don't have the Hall sensor in this list. There is no Hall uh, effect sensor. Um, now, the reality is there are over 200 different types of sensors, motors, actuators, LEDs that you can purchase uh, and, and control using this TI Innovator Hub, which is really cool. We just we can't put all of them here, so we tried to take a best guess and pick the ones we think people are going to use, knowing full well that they're going to use ones that we don't address. And so for those, we have these general categories called analog out and digital out. Um, or, um, conversely, <clears throat> analog in or digital in. So if you're doing an input, you need these. If you're doing an output, you need the ones I just showed a minute ago. Uh, so that's what that is. And so for the Hall sensor, we just use this generic analog.n1 to n3. So what I'm saying here is uh, uh, this parameter, which is the Hall sensor, uh, needs to be connected to the physical port on the innovator hub called N3. And so it's just plugging the wire into N3. That's, that's about all it is. Uh, and so here we've got our outputs now. We've got LED1 to output 1, LED2 to output 2, servo 1 to output 3. So we're telling the system what's connected where um, uh, the first thing we do. Uh, the next thing we do is we display a message on the screen saying, hey, your pet car alarm is now monitoring safety. Uh, you can tell which part of the screen to display it. So there are several rows on your screen on your calculators, and you can tell which one to do. Now I'm going to pause there for a second because this will all make a lot more sense if I actually show you the video. So I want to do that now. I apologize. This is not production quality video um, because I did this earlier today. <laughs> and so uh, hopefully you can tell what's going on. I'm going to pause the video periodically just to, um, you know, make you aware of what's going on. And there's no audio on this video, so don't worry about having any audio problems because there are none. Okay, so what, what we're having here is you can see my, my big fat hand um, holding uh, Fido uh, by his leash, and it's not around his neck. You'll notice this is a very humane project, so we, we have the Thunder Buddy uh, wrapped around its torso. Uh, and the magnet's on its feet. Okay, well, that's not humane, but uh, hopefully you get what I'm saying. So I'm putting the, uh, the, the dog near the hall sensor, and you should see the little light um, light up here. Yep, there it goes. All right, so now the dog is positioned in the back of the car, moving the camera so you can see what else is going on. Uh, and so now I'm running the program. Now you can't see what I'm doing on the computer because there just wasn't room. But what my, my fat finger is doing right now is trying to heat up the inside of the car. Uh, and when I heat it up enough, Hopefully you saw the window roll up, some pause in the video, windows up, um, the lights. I don't know if you can see this flashing or not, but just take my word for it. They are, they're flashing, uh, the horn's honking on the car, and that way we can get Fido some help because it's too darn hot to leave your dog in the car on a, on a warm summer day in Dallas, Texas. And so uh, here I'm just showing how it works. It's a feedback and control system. So what does that mean? Well, that means that if both of the conditions are met, dog's in the car, car's too hot, 
the car is going to respond. It's a feedback and control. Um, now, I'm heating the car up off and on just to show you that, hey, uh, if the heat goes down below my threshold, do I want my windows cranked open so the dog can jump out? Probably not. So the windows will close once the heat goes back down to um, below my threshold. Now, I'm taking the dog out of the car here, and I'm heating the car back up. Nothing should happen, and that's precisely what does happen. But as soon as I put Fido back in the car, the car responds. And so when Jeff was talking about this being a smart car, um, that's exactly right. This is meant to give the car some, uh, some understanding of what it's supposed to do in the case in this particular scenario where there's a baby or a, a, a toddler or a cat or a dog or some kind of pet wearing a collar with a magnet on it. Um, and, and by the way, this is how we did it. <laughs> You could use that PIR sensor, uh, that proximity sensor, you know, picks up little minute um, uh, uh, motion in the car, so you could use that. Uh, you could use a force sensor in the bottom of the car seat, you know, if you wanted to try something like that. There are probably 10 different ways to, to, to pick up um, the presence of a, a living organism inside the car. This is just how we did it, um, but like I said, you could do it any which way you want. Uh, so that's the video that kind of gives you a, a hopefully a better understanding of what's actually happening. I'm just going to let it run again in case anybody was having any video issues and, and didn't see it the first round. Um, so again, you know, dogs in the car. Um, you'll see my finger heat up the temperature sensor on the on the dashboard. Um, you know, if you wanted to do this with your kids, you might have them put windows on all the way around their car and then use a heat lamp to represent, you know, to kind of uh, represent the sun, or just take it outside on a warm day and see what happens. Um, I think that might be pretty cool to do. Uh, so obviously opening the window is meant to try to get some kind of air, uh, moving air inside the car to, to get some convection going to decrease the, uh, uh, the, the inside temperature of the automobile. Okay, so um, with that, let me jump over to uh, the resources that are available for this pro Oh, no, I told you I was going to go back to the code. Okay, so now let's go back to the code real quick before we look at the resources. All right, so I'm going to start back up at the top here. So we talked about connecting all of those sensors to the Innovator Hub, which is also connected to your handheld. Mm -hmm. So hopefully those make a little more sense now. Uh, and then we are reading temperatures. So that means we're monitoring the actual value of temperature inside the car. Uh, or outside the car, so uh, those readings are important. Uh, we're reading the values of the hall sensor, that's what this line of code refers to, send read analog dot n1. Um, get hall is, is a command that you have to have in there that says, okay, I need you to get that value, and then we need to display that value. So you, with the computer language, you have to tell it everything. You have to tell it exactly what you want it to do. Um, it's kind of like the old activities we probably all did as kids, and maybe some of you guys still have your students do it, where, you know, if uh, aliens come down from space and you have to tell them how to make a peanut butter and jelly sandwich or how to tie their shoes, well, you have to give them every single uh, movement, every single thing that they have to do. Well, computer language is the same thing. You have to tell it exactly what you want and you have to speak its language. And so uh, that's what all these commands mean. Um, so display, uh, this talking about displaying whatever's between these quotes. So pet collar sensor equals, and then hall is a variable and it's a value. So there's a numeric value associated with this variable. So it'll say pet collar sensor equals the value um, and uh, uh, bits. Bits is just a, fake unit of measure we, we have in there, and you can put whatever you want. Uh, I think there was a question on the WebEx about the italics. Uh, so the answer is, if the variable is already defined in the system, you just type the word hall, and it will italicize itself. Um, and so the TI Inspire software knows that hall is a variable, so therefore it must be italicized. So, so you don't have to, to italicize it on your own. So good question. Thanks for asking that. Um, now, PICE, 
a little bit different, um, but the same idea applies. It's a, it's a variable, um, but the syntax is pretty much the same. The only difference is you have a, uh, a, 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 a closed uh, parenthesis on the left side that, that's required, but that does it automatically for you, so you don't even really have to worry about that. So, okay, now this part is really, really important. So we had two conditions that the car had to meet. Uh, the first condition was, um, is the dog present? And the only way of knowing that is if the sensor uh, is some value that we define. Now, in this case, we're looking at uh, rough values from the hall sensor. That's why we gave it sort of fake um, units. Uh, and so uh, 500, if it's less than 500, then that means that there's a magnet in the car. That means that the dog or the, the human's in the car. If the temperature inside the car is greater than 26 and the hall sensor is less than 500, then we sound the alarm. Then we tell the car, okay, turn on light one, turn on light two, uh, run the speaker uh, at, at a 400 hertz frequency. And so uh, you can, I could go in and change this to 2000 hertz if I wanted to. It'll be really annoying, but, um, but you can, you know, you can, I think you have a range between uh, you know, probably 100 hertz to 2,000 hertz. Anything beyond that, the speaker just doesn't, it can't handle it. Um, and then a time, this is how long you're going you're gonna to do it for. You're just going to keep running that sound, okay? All right, so, uh, so that's that. And then there's another if-then-else statement. So computer languages use logic. And so in this case, we're saying uh, if the window is on um, or, it, you know, because of the conditions above, then we want to turn the servo on and we want to rotate it 50, 50 degrees um, uh, to open it. Uh, and then if the window is off, then we, we end the statement um, <clears throat> there. Uh, or if, if uh, all the conditions are not met, if both conditions are not met, then we turn everything off. So we turn the horn off, we turn the lights off, and we set this, the window back to closed. So you'll see it's a negative 50 here, whereas before it was a positive 50. So it's just the opposite. We wanted to close. Okay, so, um, all right, and then th this is just uh, dealing with uh, other conditions. So if the hall sensor is less than 500, then you can say pet is inside the car and happy. Uh, if it's not less than 500, then you would say the pet is not inside the car. So those are things that you have liberty to change and modify or just get rid of. Uh, it's really up to you. And then all this stuff at the end is just um, cleaning up the, uh, at the end of the program when everything's done and, and I uh, hit clear or hit escape rather, um, I want my lights off, I want my servo to go back to its closed position and uh, I want the program to be done. So I, I just wanted to walk through that a little bit um, because I, I'm assuming a lot of the people on the phone right now are not programmers. Um, a lot of math teachers and science teachers are really good at teaching math and science, but like me, I, I just didn't have a background in computer science. I don't have a background in computer science, I should say. Uh, but kind of going through these projects and making mistakes and trying to figure out why I made a mistake and where the mistake is and cleaning that stuff up, um, you know, it's obviously beneficial. Having your kids just explore and go after it and, and you're there as a resource, but most of the times they won't even bother you. Um, I think that's cool. And we saw that with these, uh, with these uh, STEM camps that we, we've been running with these kids. It's, it's been pretty awesome. Um, let me think here. So I wanted to show you the online resources next. And so like I said before, uh, 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 Mike is gonna share these with you, um, but I'll pull up a summary document. Um, and so let's see, this is a pet car alarm. So this gives you sort of an overview of what's going on. Pets suffer when left unattended in a hot car on a sunny day. Uh, there's some other background information here too, where, I mean, there's a lot of public information in here. Hopefully this will open up for me. Uh, I don't know what that is. Uh, now I gotta log in, I'm not doing that. Um, so, oh, here it goes, okay. So uh, this is just a website, uh, I think it's a veterinary medicine association, but it talks about, this is background information for the kids. And so uh, elapsed time of an animal left in the car. Um, this is how the outside temperature uh, looks 
And then I think, where is it? There should be another chart with the inside temperature. Uh, where am I missing? Let's see the last time. Oh, yeah, yeah, okay. So the outside temperature is this top row, the bolded number. So let's say it's 95 degrees outside. Well, inside your car, after 10 minutes, it could get up to 114 degrees, 124 degrees after 20 minutes. If you leave your animal in there for 40 minutes, it's 133 degrees, you know, on average. So there's no way um, a kid or an animal, or I don't even know if most adults could sustain that um, without have, going into a heat stroke. So it's, it's pretty dangerous stuff. Um, and the science behind the greenhouse effect is at play here and uh, the wavelengths of light and, and how light radiation can go through the glass, but heat radiation is unable to escape uh, in the inside of the car. So the inside of the car is just sitting there heating up uh, over time. And so if you leave your, you know, if you leave a dog or cat or a human <laughs> inside the car, then, uh, you know, nothing good is going to come from that. Uh, so the background's pretty strong. I think it makes a pretty strong point. So we, we have that link in there. This shows you the configuration for the uh, sensors and the hub. Um, these will, this is a parts list for your project. So we don't sell this stuff. I mean, um, we don't sell anything, actually. You, you need to go to a dealer to get a TI handheld or an innovator hub. Um, but what we did do is we, we gave you the, um, the part number for each of these sensors. So you could do a Google search and find the best prices. But like I mentioned before, they're very, very inexpensive. Um, which is nice. Now, uh, because we're not coders, we're not programmers, most of us that have been in the classroom and still are in the classroom, these are little code snippets to, to give the kids some background information as to what each of these commands mean, why are we doing this, um, and, and so that kind of prompts them along. And this is just one possible control feedback system. This is a flow chart that uh, programmers and engineers use so they know, you know how these things work. Uh, we did this in a for loop, which basically just means that for whatever variable, you can name it whatever you want. In this case, we named it N. Um, you can, I want this to uh, repeat itself up to 500 times unless I break the program before that. So you can have a for loop of 10 times or 100 times or 1,000 times, and it will just keep repeating all the stuff in between the for and the end. Um, of the program. It'll just keep repeating it. And so that's how we set this up. Now, there are more sophisticated ways to do this. Um, you know, I, I, if you guys know Fred Foch, he's a great, great um, resource, a former teacher, retired teacher, um, um, also has a computer science background. And his code looks way better than mine, <laughs> and I know that. Um, but um, he just kind of pats me on the head and says, that's okay, Eric, you, you keep trying. Uh, but for me, I don't care. I, I, it's fun. It's fun actually seeing your program work uh, and, and come to life. So it's it's been pretty cool. And like I said, if my seventh grade son uh, can learn this stuff, I know everybody on the phone uh, can do it too with all the free time you have, right? Uh, but but that's uh, that's kind of the gist. I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Lukens to tell you more about the uh, the smart irrigation system, which is a really slick project. Jeff, you want to hey, sure. jump in there? Yeah, uh, Eric, before we do that, can you go, I noticed something, believe it or not, I actually noticed something in your code. Could you go to that again for me? Yeah. Because this will, yeah. this will not, uh, the, the idea here is not, not to uh, show them where you made a mistake, but it's to point something else out. So keep, keep going down toward the bottom of that page right there, and I'll just tell you where to stop. So keep going, keep going, keep going, keep going. There we go. All right, see where it says display at two? Go up a little bit more. No, no, up, up a little higher than that. There you go. Okay, so you see at the top of your screen there, it says display at two, and in quotes, uh, it says wearing. Okay, so now one thing that Eric, one thing that Eric mentioned is, and, and it is kind of one of my hobbies to find mistakes that Eric makes, but after a while, it's no fun anymore. But when he put that in quotes, uh, remember how he said you got to tell the computer exactly what to do, otherwise it's not going to do it correctly. Well, when it's in quote and it's just displaying that, it's going to display whatever you decide you want it to display. So that right there is not a programming line. That's a display line. And I just kind of saw that and just had to point that out to you because it's kind of fun to do that, Eric, in front of 135 people on the phone. Um, 
And while you're while you're bringing up that other project, let me just tell you a quick story, you guys. It has something to do with with this activity. Several years ago, um, I was in a summer workshop. I was working with some some ag teachers, agricultural education, ag ag ed teachers in in Central Texas, and it was in the summertime. And uh, one of the guys who was with us, you know, everybody had these really cool, awesome pickups. And he said, you know, I wonder how hot it gets in the cab of my pickup if I leave it in the sun with the windows rolled up. Because everybody, you know, with when they're dealing with animals and that type of thing like Eric did in this in this uh, smart car activity, they're concerned about that. And so we, I said, well, I don't know. Let's go give it a try. And we had one temperature probe hooked up to uh, the calculator and another temperature probe or had one outside the car or outside the cab of the truck hanging outside the cab and one on the inside. And the air temperature, I'll never forget this, the air temperature was 92 degrees. And we set it to collect, we set the calculator to collect data every one, every minute for like 20 minutes. And when we went back out to collect the calculator after 20 minutes in 92 degree, uh, 92 degree temperatures with the, the truck sitting in the sun, the temperature inside the cab was 145 degrees. And I know we have some people on tonight from Canada. I got some friends on from Canada. I saw Australia on there. That's 145 degrees Fahrenheit, so not quite as impressive as it would be if it were Celsius, but still 145 <laughs> degrees. I mean, absolutely mind-boggling. So there's over a 50-degree Fahrenheit difference in 20 minutes between the outside of the cab and the inside of the cab. One thing that would be kind of, you know, we think about animals all the time. It'd be kind of interesting to hypothesize and do a project on whether a plant can survive that. I know greenhouses are, are hot, and I know they have uh, tropical, indoor tropical rainforests and zoos and that kind of thing. I know in Omaha, Nebraska, they have an indoor rainforest. But they certainly don't get to 145 degrees. So that would be uh, uh, interesting because sometimes in life science we forget about the, the whole plant world and we just worry about animals. But that would be kind of a cool little, um, I don't know if you could design a project around it other than to say, yep, the plant's dead. And nope, the plant <laughs> isn't dead. But it would still be kind of an interesting um, thing to take a look at. Um, Okay, so moving along with our second uh, activity tonight, this is actually, if I'm not mistaken, Eric, correct me if I'm wrong, this was the first kind of uh, major project using Innovator to sort of hit the streets. And um, it, it, it's called the Smart Water Project. We've had several different names kind of applied to this thing. But essentially, let me just give you a quick little backstory. This picture you're looking at on the screen is a gentleman uh, in Zimbabwe of East Africa. And there, there's a, a big story surrounding this particular project, this particular activity. But let me give you the, the gist of it and where the interest might lie for the kids in your classroom. Um, this particular town and this particular school that is mentioned in this article had a very, very good girls soccer team or girls football team, as they called it. And um, because of a drought in Zimbabwe, they were um, forced to disband their soccer team because of essentially a famine. You know, we, we in the United States or in, in North America, in uh, most of the first world countries, really have no idea what famine or hunger is all about. But when your entire family, village, town, country relies on agriculture at the very small scale level to survive, uh, literally to survive, and you don't get some of the resources needed to generate and produce the food that you need to survive, then there's something has got to give. And so what happened initially is the school canceled uh, the soccer season because kids were starting to get really weak and they, uh, you know, were malnourished and so on. So it's kind of a tragic uh, human human interest story, but one that, because we're dealing with young people in this story, really does resonate with the, the students and the children in your classes, in your middle and high school classes. So uh, from this story, which was was sort of found by uh, the, the gentleman that Eric mentioned, Fred Foch, came the idea of saying, you know, what if 
uh, we could d develop a small-scale prototype garden watering system using a cistern that would turn on and off and would be regulated by certain environmental conditions that would um, best benefit a, a garden area or a agricultural area. And so the Smart Water Project essentially was born. And this is the activity that uh, I think you can find it right, Eric, in the same place you can find the Smart Car Activity in the TI Europe, is that right? Yeah, that's right. There, it's, yeah, uh, there, there it is. Yeah, and so you just have to scroll a little bit, but um, there's a bunch of activities and languages that I don't speak. Uh, but uh, yeah, it's, it's it's right here. And like I said, it's for CE as well. There's a CE version. Oh. And you know how Eric mentioned that uh, they had a before school, sort of like a STEM club or coding club that was doing the smart car project. This one was actually first done on a large scale with a, a group of, I think freshmen and sophomores mainly in high school in, in one of the, uh, the high schools near Dallas. And it was done in an after school program. And what they did was they, uh, they eventually assembled a system that would water plants uh, when environmental conditions necessitated it. But what they did initially was they talked about, okay, so why do plants need water? And what else do plants need besides water? And so what evolved here was a sneaking, uh, sneaking in some discussion of photosynthesis, which is a requirement, necessity, very, very important thing in any life science class, whether you're talking about middle school or high school, to disregard photosynthesis is really kind of irresponsible. That's a, the foundation of all, uh, every food web and food chain on the planet. So, uh, and it's also one of the more difficult topics to get your head around because we don't do it. As, as, uh, as humans, we do not do photosynthesis, so it's a little bit tough to get our head around. So when you think about not only can a project like this be used for coding and be used for experimental design and for uh, some engineering uh, aspects of the curriculum, even if that's not part of the curriculum, it can also be used for content that, that has to be covered, if you will, for uh, within a life science classroom. So here it is. This is the uh, description of the Smart Water Project, and Eric has a bunch of pictures here, and you'll see some real similarities between this picture and the picture he showed you, except over on the left side. The left side has uh, some different sensors that are attached to it. Uh, you can see the top one is, a, is called a soil moisture sensor, which does exactly what you might suspect. It, it monitors, measures the level of moisture in the soil, those two electrodes sticking out there to the left. Uh, the the there's a charge that actually travels between those two sensors, and so it's very similar to some of the vernier sensors where they measure uh, ions in a particular solution or whatever that happens to be. By the way, I was going to mention this to you. These are not the same thing as vernier sensors. Uh, vernier sensors, if you're familiar with those, actually plug directly into TI Inspire or TI-84, or you can use a lab cradle or something like that. These are way less expensive and they are not, they do not plug in to directly to the Inspire, the 84, or the Lab Cradle. So I just want to make, make that, make mention of that. The second one down there, this is on the input side now. We're going to be bringing data into the innovator, measuring soil moisture. And then the second one is actually a dual sensor that measures both temperature and the relative humidity. So it just says humidity there, but that's the relative humidity of the air. So it's a two way sensor. And then the one on the bottom is a light sensor. And then um, I'll come back to those in just a moment. But if we take a look on the right side, based on those inputs of soil moisture, of temperature and humidity, and of light, based on those inputs, we will or will not get some kind of an output. And the output that is attached to this, like the result of, the effect of this, would be to generate a pump, to start a pump and pump water out of a cistern and water a garden with it. So if all the conditions that we set up are met with moisture in the soil, with humidity, temperature, and light, then the pump will turn on and the water will start to flow. So it's similar to like a, uh, a if you have a sprinkler system, you know, in your yard, or you know somebody who does have, I don't have one, but if, if some, I have neighbors who do, 
and the the only control there seems to be the time of day. They don't seem to much care if it's raining or not. That thing is going to come on at a particular time of day uh, during during the week. Now, what you see right above the pump is something called a MOSFET uh, sensor or an output device. Essentially, what that is doing is is it's communicating between the innovator and the pump. So that's sort of like a transistor switch that is going to actually cause the pump to turn on or turn off. And you can see that we need some battery power here uh, for the pump because that takes a little more juice than, than some of those input sensors over on the left side. Okay, so let's take a look at uh, a couple of pictures here. I can see we're, we're kind of running short on time a little bit, but let's take a look at some of the pictures of how this project has been set up. And like Eric said with the car, you can set these up any way you want. Your creativity is is your only limit to uh, what kind of a, a device setup that, that you have. So here's one picture. There is a very, very small scale garden with uh, plastic plants. And there is our uh, cistern, the, the big, it's not Tupperware, but it's uh, something that has a little, well, it looks like Australian to me. Decor, tell fresh, and then we have a, like a floating little island in the middle of it with the, our plants on it, and that little uh, thing at the top, that red thing at the top, might look like a, a light from a police car. I, although I wouldn't know about that, but some of you actually might know about that, and that is actually a sprinkler head. And so we're going to see what that does when our conditions are met using all of these sensors that we have. Uh, attached to our innovator. And you can see sort of this uh, discrete presence of the TI Inspire in the background. That's, that's sort of like the subliminal hint, like buy Inspire, buy Inspire, buy, and no, I'm just kidding. But in the foreground, there we go, there we have our innovator with all of those sensors hooked up on the left side. And then we have our battery pack on the right. And where do you think our pump is? Well, if we follow that black wire, there it is, right in the water, because it doesn't do us a lot of good if the pump is sitting in the air. We're trying to pump water, and in order to do that, we need to put it actually in the water. So the pump is connected to that black hose that flows. Look at that arrow. Look, Eric's following that right along there, following it right up to the, um, the sprinkler head. All right, so now we have a video for this as well. So if Eric can kind of cue up that little video, and we'll take a look and see what happens here. So here we start, and I might have him pause it from time to time. We just have our setup here. Nothing is happening. The sprinkler head is just sitting there, but I think we're going to see a giant hand come in here and just, whoa, there we go. All right. So here we actually have two hands with a uh, really nice watch, and you can see that our sprinkler head turned on. I wonder what he did to get that to turn on. So right now, Eric has, is this you, Eric? Yeah, that's me. <laughs> okay. So Eric has in his hand the soil moisture sensor, and then in the other hand, I'm not sure what you just picked up, but because of uh, the conditions that Eric put those sensors in, hopefully you saw the little sprinkler head turn on. We should see a little better shot of it here. So we, I think that's probably the light sensor. Yep, is that that's right, the Eric? That's it. So now we're simulating nighttime. Now we'll come back to that little point here in just a second. I think we only have a few seconds left of the video. Well, maybe we're restarting it. So a good question to pose to the students and also maybe to pose to yourself is, well, why would we care about the light? Why would we turn it on? Why would we turn the sprinkler on? when there's not much light? Well, because of this this uh, phenomenon called evaporation. And also from, from plants, there's a, pro there's a process called transpiration where the water actually leaves from the leaves and then gets uh, uh, absorbed by the air, evaporates into the air. But we see people all the time. If you live in places where people water their lawns, you see them watering their lawns during the day, maybe during the hottest part of the day, and they are not only wasting water, they're wasting a lot of money. So that is what causes towns, cities, maybe even states to have these things called watering restrictions, which, you know, probably only Americans would have to worry about stuff like that because most <laughs> other places don't really, aren't unwise enough to be pouring water on a lawn, which is not edible, 
during the daytime. So uh, those water restrictions are almost always from hours of like 10 in the morning till 4 in the afternoon. And so we might hear stuff like that and just accept it rather than asking, gee, I wonder why we have water restrictions during those times. Well, this is one example, uh, this model right here that Eric was showing us is one example of that. And it would make no sense, it would make, make no practical sense to water a garden, even though I've done it myself, during the heat of the day when most of the water, I don't know how much, but a high percentage of the water would evaporate before it even got to the place where it was supposed to do its good, which is in the plant. Okay, I don't think I took a breath there for about five minutes. So uh, I, I'm, looking, I'm looking at our time. Go ahead, Eric. No, yeah, I, I saw a couple of comments come in. Uh, um, one person was saying, hey, you know, you shouldn't water at night because it may cause mold. And that's the exact kind of discussion that this kind of project uh, lends itself to, to have those kinds of debates and discussions in the classroom. I think that's really powerful. Um, you know, it, it really depends on what your climate's like, what kind of plants you're trying to water. Uh, you, you know, there are a lot of factors. What kind of soil do you have? You know, it, it, you don't want to spray your lawn or your garden if the soil's super, super dry. You want to use more of a drip irrigation approach because otherwise it just runs right off the top. So there's a bunch of cool discussions that can take place and arguments um, with your with your students with this kind of project. So I, I, I appreciate that. Uh, uh, observation that someone made there. That's pretty cool. That's awesome. And there, it brings up some great biological environmental studies discussion. Uh, you could say, well, really, would we have to worry about that if we were in Arizona compared to Florida? <laughs> and Eric, you actually lived in Florida, and I know mold is probably a, a reality, but in a place like Tucson, Arizona, where the air is really, really dry, I would guess, and I don't know this for sure, but I would guess there would be less of a concern about that than there would be in a place where it's very, very humid, like along the Gulf Coast. Yeah. Well, so, hey, uh, okay. Jeff, I want to, can I make a quick plug? Do. Go for it. Yeah. Well, just for time, and uh, Mike, cut me off when you need to. But those of you that are interested in this and you already have uh, TI handhelds at your school, but you want to, you know, try this out, maybe start your own STEM club. Um, we, meaning uh, me and, and uh, uh, a couple other folks in the office are looking for some candidates uh, to, um, to help, to assist with their own STEM club. And, uh, oh darn, I don't have that document here. I'll just type my email out. Um, and so if you're interested in this and you, you know, we can borrow, you can borrow the technology from us if you want as well, uh, innovators, the sensors, uh, that kind of stuff. But if you want to start your own STEM club and maybe try these projects with your students, um, I'm going to put my, my, my name and my email address here. Um, please email me um, specifically what you're looking for because we can, even if you're in, you know, somewhere outside of Dallas, which is most of you, uh, we can get on the phone with you. We can have the ETC come in and help, you know, as they're available. Uh, we can ship all the supplies to you for free. Uh, you know, you can borrow those for an extended period of time, uh, you know, as, 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 as we have available, of course. But we're looking for about 20 places that want to do this with their kids. And so uh, if this is you, if you have TI technology already and you want to borrow the innovators, if you want to borrow some of these sensors that Jeff was talking about or I was talking about, uh, email me. Let me know what you want to do. And uh, we can start a discussion about that because we want to support you um, any way we can. We think this stuff is worthwhile. We think it's really cool. Uh, and we know your kids will benefit from it. So, all right, that was it for me. All right, Mike, you want to take over? Yep. Thanks so much, Jeff and Eric, for everything you shared. We are going to wrap things up tonight. Um, and earlier, Jeff mentioned during the agenda uh, about the, I believe, Jeff, you called it a TI Love Fest, uh, but the TQ International Conference, uh, which is, again, a great place um, to really get your hands on the TI Innovator and uh, some of the other sensors that you could possibly use. So um, uh, please join us at the TQ International Conference in San Antonio. Uh, and Jeff mentioned that we're going to be giving away tonight to one lucky winner, a registration for two to the conference, and tonight's lucky winner is Hannah Hunter. So Hannah, congratulations. Uh, we'll be in touch over email in the next couple of days to give you a little more information, but we hope to see Hannah as well as everyone else 
at the T-Cubed International Conference. To receive a certificate of attendance, go ahead and click that link in the chat window. Also listed is a link for the documents that were used tonight by uh, Jeff and Eric. Uh, so those two activities that were shared tonight, um, you'll get uh, those two activities with that documents link. If you happen to miss these links for one reason or another, um, or they're not working for you for some reason, uh, feel free to just ha hang tight in your email. You'll automatically get a follow-up email in a couple days, uh, and that follow-up email will be a link to the recording as well as a link to the documents and their certificate as well. And if you're watching this on demand, go ahead and just copy that link down into your browser to receive your certificate. Thanks so much, Jeff and Eric, for everything you shared tonight. Um, it's really great to see uh, Texas Instruments uh, putting together activities that can be used in the classroom that, that benefit uh, students on multiple levels. So thanks so much for, uh, for doing this tonight. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks again, everyone. We hope to see you back online next week. Have a great night.